Hey, Rocky, welcome to the podcast. I'm thrilled to have you here. Would you like to give yourself a bit of an intro to the guests? Oh, Marianne, thank you for having me. Yes, my name is Rocky Snyder. And officially, as the, the certificates on the wall will say, I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist, as well as a certified personal trainer. I have had a studio, a training facility in Santa Cruz, California, since 1996. So for almost 25 years now, I have been doing a whole bunch of moving with people and, and lifting heavy objects, putting them down and, and a whole bunch of other things. <laughs> I love seeing the um, Indian clubs up the top there behind your right shoulder. Yes. Yeah, yes. So I've only just come across them. I think via you in the forum a few weeks ago. I haven't had a play with them yet, but I'm looking forward to getting into some of those. Well, you could probably use that ulnar or whatever is hanging back there by the foot there. Just use a human bone. It will work just fine. Yeah, the Indian clubs are have saved my my right shoulder and particularly the years of suffering and surgery. And I have been utilizing those to continually just explore movement in my own body as well as the people that come in. And of course, being in Santa Cruz, much like where you are, it is just a, it's the surf town here on the on the California coast. In fact, it was the very first place where the Royal Hawaiian princes came in 1885 and paddled out to catch some waves on mainland US. So that's one of the kind of claim to fames in Santa Cruz. And being a surf kind of culture here, we've got a lot of people that are surfers and we find that the Indian clubs have been very valuable to save a lot of older surfers shoulders from from also surgery and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see a lot of surf paddling injuries in shoulders. So that is bang on. I'm going to bring those to Margaret River. Mm. Thank you, Rocky. So Rocky, back pain. I'm sure you have clients that you've seen and you've helped through their journey with back pain. Yes. Have you in your many years come to some basic concepts and foundations and observations about people with back pain? Particularly, and we're talking about here the stubborn and persistent kind. Not that, you know, you were in the garden, it's a bit sore, it's better a week later. I'm talking about those clients that have had it for a very, very long time and they're really stuck. There just doesn't seem to be anything that's shifting. How, how do you approach clients like that? Well, initially, I, I began this kind of process and the work that I do, seeing people in regards to realigning their posture about 25 years ago, I had a mentor who was uh, kind enough to, to take me under his wing for about five years and taught me about posture assessment and the alignment of the body. And he had worked with Pete Igoscu with the Igoscu method in Southern That's California cool. for many years. So this was a derivation of that approach. And, and from there, I went to a chiropractic clinic where I was, I, I consider it more or less speed dating, where I would get somebody for about 20 minutes, have to kind of figure out what's going on with them. And a lot of those people were chronic or acute sufferers of low back pain. And the, the things that really became evident was it wasn't the, the back wasn't the issue. It was, it was almost like the speaker of the body mm -hmm. that was trying to scream out to say, something's not quite right. And many of the approaches leading up to that point were all looking at the, the victim of the crime, so to speak. And they weren't hunting down who the culprit was that was causing this, this area of the body to scream out. And so this allowed me a new perspective in, in terms of not looking at the symptom site so much and focusing all my attention on where the pain was, but what wasn't participating? What does, wasn't doing what they should? What area of the body was not, was not doing what it needed to do and was therefore asking other areas to try and make up for it? So that's, that's one thing that, that I really notice is, is that we can't compartmentalize the body and only treat one area. In fact, I can't treat, it goes beyond my scope of practice. Treatment is not what I do, but what I do is explore movement with people where there isn't movement and try and slow down where there's too much. So and it's more about I'm just, time. I'm just gonna interrupt and say that is a powerful treatment, what you're doing. Exploring movement is a treatment. Carry yeah, on. Okay. 
Well, thank you, thank you. Just just don't tell the governing bodies that look over. Me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, and and truly, I I couldn't agree more. It really is how the body should be treated, how it should be enjoyed and and explored. But then what we begin to realize is that it's this constant, I won't say give or take, but uh, one of my mentors, one of our fellow mentors, Chris Shridharan, came up recently and said, you know, I don't look at it as the onion layer so much as a negotiation between areas of the body. And that just struck a chord with me. Yes, every time you bring some element into fold, now there's something else to negotiate. And so we can look at previous injuries and episodes, emotional disturbances, or whatever the case may be. These are all elements that we're constantly having to negotiate within our physical frame, as well as our, our mental and emotional being. So for those people that are, those, that are dealing with these chronic issues that keep repeating, what we find is we need to give them a different way of negotiating. We've got to bring them to the table and figure out a new way that we can communicate movement through the body and get it so that it's not the same repeating pattern. The other thing that I've noticed, Marion, is, is that many people that are the chronic sufferers have this way of, of the body telling or the subconscious mind telling the conscious mind when there's threat or stress, when there is a point where in their day-to-day, -day, something is not quite right. And the subconscious doesn't have the best ability to communicate to our conscious mind where language is, is regulated. Because we're talking about where posture and movement is basically at the subconscious level. So how do you take the old brain and communicate to the new brain? Well, the last time the old brain got the new brain's attention was through a certain pattern of pain. And that worked really well last time, even though the situation may be different, if the subconscious needs to get the attention of the conscious mind, could it not try the same approach as last time? So now we see that this area that has gained attention continually is where it goes every time, although the situation may vary from one moment to the next. So we've got to take that into consideration also. And that's why it's very important that we don't continually come back with the same solution to the same issue that a person presents. It may be that one person, let's just say they, they rolled their ankle and over the course of time found a new way to move to get away from the pain. That eventually brought on some back pain. And they went through some different mechanics and movement to resolve their ankle, to bear their weight properly, and the pain in their back went away. But that action got the attention of the conscious mind. So this time, when the bills start piling up and they have lost their job or they have uncertainty looming off on the horizon, their back starts bothering them again. Well, is it the ankle that's the issue? No, that's why we have to kind of become detectives and we need to hunt down the clues to see if what is the underlying cause of this chronic issue. And I think that's where a lot of the, the approaches might fall short because we get into this pattern of, oh, here it comes again. We'll do the same approach that we did last time and maybe we'll get some temporary relief, which is, which is most likely, but it's not actually gonna be long lasting. And so that sufferer of chronic pain just goes from one moment to the next without truly getting beyond. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think, <clears throat> I think a lot of people seem happy with temporary relief and almost willing to accept that that's as good as they can hope for and why do you think we why do you think many people accept temporary relief as enough instead of I guess investing on a long longer process of really fine-tuning the machinery so that it can serve them well for the rest of their lifetime Well, I'm going to get out there more into a cultural aspect. I think that many of the belief systems in our world have created a mindset that we are less than, that we do not deserve to be 
as happy as we could potentially be, as mm. free as we could potentially be, mm. whether it's the Judeo-Christian belief systems, the Muslim belief systems. I think the only ones that may veer away from that and in, in my understandings and studies of, of, of world religions would be the Buddhist belief system. But uh, yeah, this may be a little bit too out there, but within the American culture, there is always this permeating, uh, the, this, this idea that we always need more. We're never truly satisfied. And, and at the same time, that's coupled with, this is as good as it's going to get. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if it's something that's just ingrained into our cultural system and that there's always things that could alleviate short-term problems that you can get in a drugstore, pharmacy, or over the counter, whatever the case may be. It's very interesting to see how many advertisements come across the television when watching news segments. And you can see one drug company after another, after another, trying to, to just give this approach. And, and really, it's, it's not offering anything different than the advertisement before. In fact, it will offer these, these quiet little quick quips in there is that the, here are the potential side effects. So there is this, there is this kind of dichotomy. Well, I want to get better, but am I willing to go through this to get there? And, and uh, I don't know if I truly answered your question, but I, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that we, we need to be coaches in our work to say that you, the client, the patient are so able to achieve even more than you could possibly realize. And, and we can be the guide to, to take you on that path, but ultimately you have to be the one to, to make the journey. And when people can grasp onto that concept, it's amazing the change that occurs in their life. And I'm not just talking about pain being gone. I'm talking about doing things that they were not thinking that they would be able to achieve, or attaining goals or, or going out and creating new ones. And it's, it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree that there's times where you'll be working with a person and you will just be able to put them in a place, allow them to be in some space where there's a freedom from pain, there is a, a more license to move, and suddenly they start hopping on their toes or they start almost dancing or skipping around the room. And this coming from a person who trotted in in discomfort or pain, and then they're suddenly skipping around and you can feel that they're they're bubbling. And, and suddenly they say, wow, I. I think I want to go swimming right now, or I feel like going for a hike. You know, there's always this kind of, this idea that, oh, I feel like I want to go. That is the moment that I know that, that we've, we've hit that magic moment, that place that has unlocked mm. them from the prison cell of the mind that they've created. Yeah, almost a, it's an energy shift, isn't it? I guess they are. And I think all these thoughts that jump into our head you know, it's that it's the analogy of the radio station. We tune in, and whatever energy state we're in, are the thoughts that jump in. So, I never think our thoughts. I always think, how many of my thoughts are actually my thoughts, or just something I'm tuning into from out there that just drop in? But um, it sounds in that situation like you you get someone into another level where they, then they can have these new inspired thoughts come in. If you're talking about um, the culprits, so you mentioned. You know, and we know from our from our you know co uh, education of the AIM model that if one part of us is not moving, another part of us sometimes compensates by moving more. When we come to back pain, if if, if we look at hip mobility and pelvis, do you see some general patterns of more hip mobility, stiffer spine, or vice versa? Mm, really good question. Yeah, there, there's patterns and shapes that are repeated often with people that come in. But then, of course, everyone's an individual. So although there may be trends in a certain shape that they take on, 
how they do that and why they do that is going to be unique to that person. But yes, we'll see somebody with a posteriorly tilted pelvis where the, the tailbone is tucked downward, the front of the pelvis is tilting upward. And then we'll see that there's more mass in their forefeet and that we're going to see a greater lordotic curve in their lumbar region and they're going to make up for that with excessive kyphosis in their mid back curling and caving in so though that's a quite of a, a common occurrence and so we can look at it from a muscle standpoint and understand that maybe the muscles in the front portion of the hips and pelvis are being lengthened and under load, like they are bearing the weight of that individual as the pelvis is shifting forward in that posterior tilt. And those muscles do not have the capacity at that point in time, for whatever reason, to shorten up back into a more resting state. And then counter side of that is the muscles on the backside of the pelvis, the buttocks and hamstrings. Those muscles will be in a shortened state almost passively where they're just, they're just hanging there because nothing is asked to support or, or to support the, the weight of the body back there. So we begin to see these imbalances occur quite regularly. And so then it's just a question. It really comes to a very, um, if it's not A, then B, should I drive them deeper into where they go so they can recognize they don't want to be there and they bring themselves back? Or do I want to encourage them in a place where they don't travel to see if their body can kind of facilitate what it needs to do in that region? And in so doing, waking up muscles that were dormant or inhibited, if you might want to use that, and then reducing the excitation of other muscles that are bombarded. So I definitely see that within the pelvis, of course, there are only so many options, right? We can, we can tilt it forward or tilt it backward. There's no other type of forward and backward motion that that pelvis will, will have, at least in, in that regard. And when it comes to side to side motion, it can translate, but it can also laterally tilt or hiking and dropping if we might want to turn it that way. And then when it comes to rotation, we can either turn it one direction to the left or one direction to the right it really comes down to very simplistic movements and can they achieve those in a in a fairly unrestricted manner where do they prefer to go and where do they not want to travel and again can can we just give them that exploration and as soon as we do that i mean there's there's 57 muscles that cross the pelvis 45 drop to the legs 12 go up toward the upper body and we could pick apart like conventional approaches have been doing for several years now and blaming it all on one muscle for mm. the problem of the world. Mm. Like your psoas is responsible for missing your mortgage payment <laughs> or your glute medius is now responsible for, for the poor grades your children are getting in school, you know, as well as your lower back. But instead of being so so oh, so unfair to those muscles, what if we just got the, the hips to move, the pelvis to move in all of these different manners? What would the soft tissue of all 57 muscles have to do? Well, they would have to work in a concerted effort and an orchestrated fashion. And then the next thing you know, your spine is going, wow, this is amazing. I can actually communicate better with the pelvis now that I understand how it can move. It's just, it's just a wonderful thing. As soon as you guide people into what they've been missing, so much opens up. Their, their day brightens. It's just I, I think you're, I think you're actually listening. You've got the ability to hear what the body's saying as well. You know, I, I sometimes feel like I'm really the advocate for the body to the person. It's like they can't interpret the signal, so I have to be the, the translator. And, I, and, you know, I have to say, <laughs> you know, what your body's trying to get you to notice is this. What your body's telling you when it gives that signal is this. And once you train someone again to reconnect with their internal signals, then they're away. They've got it. It's like training them to drive a car. You know, green means go, red means stop, orange means just, just go easy and see what feels right. So we have all these signals coming to us in any moment in real time when we move. And that's what's perfect about pain from my perspective is, like you said, it's the only way the body can communicate. It doesn't have words. So it has to give you 
an alarm bell and the pain is just that it's just an opportunity saying well the way you're currently moving is not working for me right now can you move your weight a bit here and then try it and see what that feels like or can you step your foot back a bit and try it this way so your description of the you know not like you said about these eight pelvic movements if all we could evolve, if, if we could just change one thing about how back pain was assessed, this is my way of thinking, is that instead of the standard assessment, can you bend and touch your toes? Can you extend? Can you laterally flex? Can, which is testing spinal motion, but not necessarily pelvic motion. If we could change that one thing, I think, and we could really just take the approach that, all right, we're just going to have this person learn eight movements of their pelvis on their feet that feel equally about right. I really think we'd have much better outcomes with back pain. I think also along with that is that our understanding of the spine being not one solid bone, mm -hmm. because right now the approach is, is that we're just going to brace and cause everything to just keep the spine from moving. Whether we're doing prone planks, lateral planks, or just holding inward and working with your breath and keeping yourself contracted, pressing your back into the ground while supine or whatever the case is. But this spine is, is beautiful. It does need to, to move in, in not a whip-like or snake-like fashion, but a wave of fluidity this, this, we are mostly water. So, and Bruce, uh, Bruce Lee said it m marvelously, you know, can we, can we move like water? Can that spine fluidly flex and extend in concert with other parts of the body? Can, like you say, laterally flex and rotate, but can we allow the body to do that and still be dynamically stable? So that approach to exercise or rehabilitation needs to be something that is more readily available or, or perhaps explored rather than, okay, we're just going to go on lockdown. Yeah. And that's, that's almost like a fear-based approach. We don't want you moving. Just yeah. keep it from going anywhere. And then now you were just creating a new prison cell for this person to reside in. So... Yeah, yeah, I, I think so what, understanding move, movement better. Yeah, and, and you, you're describing the difference between movement and exercise in a way. Exercise is this idea of repeating a set movement with resistance, certain amount of time. That's very prescriptive and that's exercise. Movement is so much more open-ended and it's about multi-directional. It's about quality of how we achieve the directions and it's also a little bit about what feels good <laughs> you know people with exercise get so locked into what they're told not what they're feeling and you know that's kind of why i love movement is a much better word what i was uh, going to ask you is how what do you what do you how, how do you personally react when you come across seven best exercises for back pain or you know, the multitude of YouTube clips out there from yoga teachers, do these five moves for your back and it will be fine. Like what, what, what's your personal reaction to things like that? Uh, I roll my eyes for the most part, you know, it's, it's not something that, yes, it's, it's uh, window dressing. It's, it's wonderful. It'll gain attention and their YouTube subscribers or whatever they're seeking will go through the roof. Those little quick hacks are, are a wonderful way to get the attention. But it, I, you know, I would imagine that more than 50% of the people that attempt those types of moves will benefit in some way or other. But then there is the other 40, 30, whatever percentage, the, the minority that are actually not going to benefit, that it may be detrimental, that it isn't the right thing for their particular body. So the cookie cutter, one size fits all, one exercise program fits all is not, it's unfortunate because that's what we promote in our culture. And, and that's the I think that the majority of people need something that pigeonholes them into a certain category or place that we're not allowed to explore it as individuals because you have lived a unique and wonderful existence with all the pitfalls and crests of your, of your life. 
and you get to own all of that because no one else will come close to doing exactly what you've done. So your body is, is quite unique in what it has had to, to experience to go from your birth to where you are now. So how can we think that there is one program that's going to benefit everybody across the board. You mentioned exercise too. And, and I look at exercise actually as repetitive stress syndrome. That's what I think. <laughs> I truly. I love yeah. it. Explain that. Well, you know, we, we hear about people with carpal tunnel and that's a repetitive stress. They're, they're doing the same mechanical movement over time for a long period of time. And somewhere along the way, that symptom will occur. Or we may have tennis elbow, golfer's elbow. Um, any of these maladies, so to speak, are known as repetitive stress syndrome. But when we look at the conventional way in which we approach exercise, we're looking at how many sets, how many repetitions of the same movement over and over and over. Now, how many people actually change their exercise routines and how often do they do that is probably a very small group of people. And yet they will go and they will reinforce the things that they're very good at because there's some some reinforcement that, oh, this is something I'm good at, I'll keep on doing it. And they're not exploring what their weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. And that whole story of a chain being as strong as its weakest link can apply here. We continually use or select the movements in a gym setting or or exercise setting that is going to be focusing on the the big links where you're strong. And and we, we get away from where it is that I'm not moving well. And not that I wanna re do a repetitive action in any way, but the fact is we can have so many various movements. We can think of so many ways in which to move the body. And yet we stick in these robotic paths with the understanding that, oh, this is good for me. When in truth, somewhere down the road after our twenties and thirties, the repercussions of those repetitive actions, the wear and tear patterns begin to emerge. And then we're told, oh, well, we're getting older when in yeah. fact it was really something else. It wasn't the aging process as it was the constant bombardment over time of these repetitive patterns. So exercise, yeah, it's, it's repetitive stress syndrome. Yeah, I like it. And I think, I think adding variety to daily movements is such a really simple, practical way to maintain what I would call the richness of our motor cortex. You know, it's a part of our brain that neuroplastically can grow and be more stimulated by this, this variety. And, you know, I, I really am a big fan for, even when people walk, just play, play with your gait pattern, you know, walk a hundred meters with your right foot turned out, walk a hundred meters with your left foot turned out, walk a hundred meters with two feet turned in, walk with two feet turned, like play. It doesn't matter. It's just got to be this constant variety. Swing one arm, then swing the other, you know, like turn left, turn right. There's no right or wrong. It's just stimulus, 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 stimulus response. And, and that, that concept that movement is about our nervous system rather than our muscles is um, quite a quite a big one, I think. Well, so, aside from walking, working with people with chronic back pain, we also have quite a few people that are living with Parkinson's disease. Oh, and, interesting. And yeah, it's and of course some of those fall into the same category between chronic back and Parkinson's. But with Parkinson's, there is a reduction of dopamine that is created, and and the, where it's regulated for the most part is in the cerebellum, in that that subconscious, that old brain. And that area of the brain really loves novelty. And so that repetitive motion over and over is only good for a few repetitions before the excitation of that area is reduced and somewhere else in the motor cortex or frontal lobe begins to get more stimulated. So in order to keep dopamine production, that kind of feel good and, and to try and keep the action in the cerebellum, we will continually create variety in movements, maybe doing the same exercise, but just like you say, doing it in different ways. There's 27 different variations to how you can place your feet underneath you when you're standing. And the same with your hands, say in a plank or a push-up. there's 27 different hand positions that you could create. And, and so we explore all those. How do we move in different ways? Can we change the tempo? Can we change the, the range of motion? Can we change the degree of movement? all these things and we change it 
as we go, keeping them literally on their toes. And it's amazing what that will create, not only in the motor neurology or the neurological system, but in the emotional state and in their posture. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah, and, and obviously the research with Parkinson's and dance feeds into your change in tempo, change in rhythm. You know, though tempo and rhythm are vital aspects of movement too that rarely get spoken of. Just on that, have you um, played with the Naboso insoles for the Parkinson patients and what sort of results have you had with that? Yes, yeah, so we have a Nabozo mat, which mm -hmm. is about the size of a yoga mat. And rather than do the insoles, we just ask the participants to just to kick their shoes off. They can leave their, their socks on if they'd like to, but stand on the mat while we yeah. do some movements. And it's been people, not only with Parkinson's, but those that are suffering from peripheral neuropathy, where there's a, a, a decrease in nerve uh, stimulation in say the sole of their feet. As soon as they stand on that, immediately they they change They're, they they instantly feel different and so we start moving doing balance work or stepping actions or anything while standing on there and it's it's been remarkable yeah i the nabozo technology has been great yeah I'm, I'm i'm looking down here at my naboso mat it's about a meter away i use it just for basic clients i think there's a lot of people that because they've been wearing thick soled rigid shoes and the, their feet never get off any flat surface and they're not their foot's not experiencing different textures I, I think generally even in the non-neurological patient there's a numbness in our feet so that when we you know go down the process of exploring foot pressures some people can't feel much so I, I definitely use it to heighten their awareness so they can actually start to feel some things so Rocky you, what would be, uh, in your opinion, I, you know, the Bulletproof Back program, I didn't want to create a program, you know, how to get out of pain or, you know, what we're working towards is this idea if we're trying to build some Bulletproof Backs. When I say that word, what comes up for you? Mm. Uh, actually, it's more full body for bulletproofing the back. And the back, like we said earlier, is often the victim of the crime where the culprits are lying elsewhere that aren't getting the, the movement that they need. And we just touched upon one of the biggest ones being the feet. So one thing that we will encourage everyone to do in our studio is we have taken two tennis balls and with athletic tape, tape them together side by side and across the equator end to end with taped and then in between. And it looks much similar to a peanut. And that's what we call it is the peanut. And they will take their shoes off, place the peanut on the floor and simply for one or two minutes, apply pressure onto those balls and roll their feet back and forth. And what that does in so many ways is it stimulates the tissue that runs up the backside of their body or what we might call the posterior chain or the deep line. So this, the plantar tissue on the sole of the foot connects into the Achilles tendon, which runs up through the calf muscle that attaches to the hamstrings in regards to the fascial trains, then the sacred tuberous ligaments by the, the tailbone running up the spine from there to the occipital ridge or the ridge of the base of the skull on the backside of the head. And that tissue runs all the way over and attaches to the eyebrows. So it's a very long connective chain that runs down along the spine. And by stimulating one area, we can actually stimulate the chain through the rest. In fact, sometimes just not as a parlor trick, but more as a demonstration of how just rolling the feet might allow the back to relax is somebody will do just a standing toe touch, find out what their range of motion is like, and then take their, their peanut and roll out both feet and then check in again. Has there been any change? And all we're really looking for is, is, is there been a different response? And for the most part, I would say nine out of 10 times, somebody is going to be able to go deeper into that range of motion. And of course, we'll do that a few times at the beginning, having them practice touching their toes, provided there's no pain, so that they will have been warmed up and they'll find their end range. Then they roll out their feet and suddenly there's It's not warming up and touching their toes for a second time or whatnot. So feet would be a, a, one of those elements that we'd want to stimulate to send information up through the rest of their body. 
to let the back know that one, they're not alone in the world. We're trying to bring friends to the party, so to speak. <laughs> the, the other thing would be to allow the hips to flow fluidly in three dimensions. And I'm, I'm truly convinced that most back pain is not the fault of the back but how the rest of the body is managing its mass because honestly, the upper body's mass is teetering on a stack of cups we'll call the spine, but that's on a waiter's tray, which is the pelvis. And that waiter's tray is being teetered on two dowels underneath it. So it's this constant management of mass and juggling things around. And suddenly, honestly, we'll find that the low back problem is, is a, a recipient of this mismanagement of mass. So not only can I ask my hips to move fluidly side to side, forward and back and rotating left and right and stimulating my feet, but I also might want to see where my upper body is in relation to my hips. And I guess one of the other things that I enjoy trying to get people to do is becoming children again. And, and having some child's play. And one of the simplest ways is to see what it's like to crawl. Can they simply get on their hands and knees and then eventually hands and toes with their knees underneath them? What is it like to crawl around? Can they crawl with the right leg and right arm going forward at the same time? Can they crawl with the left arm and the right leg going forward at the same time? Can they crawl sideways? Can they crawl backwards? Can they crawl at a different tempo? And the wonderful thing here is now we're getting the shoulders and the hips to communicate through the spine in a non-loaded way that will stimulate a whole bunch of the muscles. And if we think about how we grew up as children, we started there before we learned how to be upright. So maybe we just need to take it back a little bit. So those would be three things that would be fun to explore perhaps and see how, how does the back feel after that? Uh, Beautiful. I, you're the king of analogies, aren't you? Like this waiter's tray and the calves, loving that, you know, that's a really great analogy for what we're asking the spine to do in any moment. On your crawling, I love that too. And, and you know, if we talk about neurodevelopmental sequences in kids, you know, the Feldenkrais would add in the spinning and the rolling, you know, and, and if we think about that in the context of back pain, the rolling, side to side, forward and back. Then you're getting that hydration of your fascial tissue. The extensors can become hydrated just with the contact on and off the floor. So, you know, you could, you could marry those two in quite beautifully. I, um, I do a little bit of that in some of my classes. It's interesting, not specifically for back pain, but um, yeah, I can see the benefit. Well, Rocky, thank you. Um, I think you've shared some really interesting ideas today. And I guess... I guess moving forward, I wasn't going to ask this question, but I, I just feel impelled to. What would you like to see one thing change about how we manage people with back pain? And you've probably already said it and you can repeat yourself. And it may be for you just that you don't want people to perceive and treat and focus on back pain by focusing on the back. You'd like them to explore either above or below for the real culprit. Would that be it? Uh, yeah, I think I think that would be suffice to say that's that's correct I, I think the interesting thing about pain as we're learning through brain science is the pain is not actually happening at the site that you're experiencing it the pain is actually occurring in the brain itself so that's just something to kind of consider it's not like it doesn't exist i'm not trying to negate the fact that you're experiencing what it is you're experiencing but where it's actually happening is not in the space in which you are perceiving it. Mm -hmm. And just by having that kind of understanding may very well change how you relate to that experience. And knowing that it is your brain's way of trying to continue to help you survive. And I, I think along with that, the, the way in which protocol is set forth in a conventional way where we are symptom-based approach we must go to is something that I would like to see shattered and that we begin in some fashion to address the individual and, and all they present 
rather than address the symptom. So that would be a huge turn. So symptoms as feedback uh, rather than the issue. They're just offering us some insights into our own thoughts, feelings and behaviours and, and when we can see them in that context, they're for our benefit and they can lead the process of inquiry, which can lead you to some pretty uh, cool revelations about your own existence. So, you know, really, they're to be welcomed, aren't they? Welcome yeah, to yeah. move through until the it's next not, one. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, all right, we, Rocky, thank yeah. you so much. We could talk all day and we probably have already today, but uh, I appreciate it. Lovely getting to know you. And now every time I see your name come up in the forum, I will... Uh, have a, have a face for the name. Thanks for sharing what you know. Marion, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And can you just quickly let us know about your book and about your website and where people listening to you want to know more, they can hunt you down. Yes. So I, I've written a few books. The most re recent one is called Return to Center, Strength Training to Realign the Body, Recover from Pain and Achieve Optimal Performance. You can find it on any internet bookseller, most likely. And and essentially, it's taking the, the teachings from anatomy and motion and overlaying it into the strength conditioning world. And the website is simple enough, Rocky Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, rockysnyder.com. And you're welcome to look on social media with that same name. You'll probably find me on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the rest. But right. this has been a joy. I really appreciate it. You're all over it. Well done, Rocky. Love it. Keep up, keep up the great work, my friend. Thank you.